Chapter 12 Las Vegas Bond came out of the airport building at Las Vegas. A voice said, Are you going to the tiara? Bond turned and saw a short, heavy man with large brown eyes. Yes, said Bond. Okay, let's go. Bond followed him to his car. It was a taxi. He threw his suitcase onto the back seat and climbed in after it. They drove out of the airport. I'm Ernie Cureo, said the driver. I'm a friend of Felix Leiter. He told me to look after you. Are you staying long? Maybe for a few days, said Bond. After driving for some time, the wide road went on through lines of colored lights and signs until they were in downtown Las Vegas. The sun was uncomfortably hot. We're coming into the famous strip now, said Cureo after a minute or two. Here are all the big hotels and casinos. That's the Flamingo, and that's the Sands. And here's the Desert Inn and the Sahara. Over there is the Thunderbird, and across the road is the Tiara. He slowed down and stopped outside the Spang Hotel. I guess you know all about Mr. Spang, said Cureo. I know a little, said Bond. You can tell me the rest another time. Okay, said Cureo. I'm sure you'll be safe on your first night. Bond had lunch next to the tiara's big swimming pool, then went to his room. It was very comfortable, with expensive furniture, a radio and a television. He slept for four hours. During this time, a secret wire recorder under the table next to the bed recorded complete silence. When Bond woke up, it was seven o'clock. The wire recorder heard him phone the hotel desk. I want to speak to Miss Tiffany Case. A pause, then... All right, please tell her that Mr. James Bond called. The recorder heard him move about the room. It heard the noise of the shower. And at 7.30 p.m., it heard the noise of the key in the lock when he went out and shut the door. Half an hour later, the recorder heard a knock on the door. A man wearing a waiter's uniform came into the room with a bowl of fruit. There was a note with it. From the hotel manager. The man walked quickly to the table by the bed and removed the wire from the recorder. He put a new wire in the machine. Then he put the fruit on the table and went out and closed the door. For several hours after that, the wire recorder heard nothing. Bond sat in the tiara bar and slowly drank a martini. Has Mr. Spang been in tonight? he asked the barman. I haven't seen him, said the barman. He usually comes in about eleven o'clock. Bond walked across to the blackjack tables. He stopped at the center table, the table where he was going to sit at ten o'clock. It was now eight thirty. Eight players sat round the table opposite the dealer. The dealer was about forty years old. He dealt two cards into the eight numbered spaces on the table in front of the bets. The bets were mostly five or ten silver dollars, or counters worth twenty dollars. Nobody spoke. The waitresses moved around in the space inside the circle of tables. From this space, two tough-looking men with guns at their waists watched the tables and players carefully. Bond watched the game for a short time, then walked to the Opal Room restaurant. He sat at a corner table and ordered a steak and a martini. Then he ate his dinner and thought about the rest of the evening. He was becoming bored with this job, and he did not like taking orders from a cheap gangster or trying to please Mr. Spang. Just before ten o'clock, he walked into the casino. There are two ways of doing this job, he thought. Sit and wait for something to happen, or make something happen. Chapter 13 An Interesting Evening 
The dealer now at the centre blackjack table was Tiffany Case. So that's her job at the tiara, thought Bond. All the blackjack dealers at the tables were pretty women. They all wore the same smart western clothes, short grey skirt with a wide black belt, a grey shirt and a black handkerchief round the neck, a grey cowboy hat and black boots. So, Tiffany is going to help me win $5,000, Bond thought. He sat down opposite her. Hi, she said, smiling politely. Bond put ten $100 notes across the betting line on the table. One of the two tough-looking men walked across and stood next to Tiffany. He was called a pit boss. Maybe this man would like new cards, the man said, looking at Bond. He gave Tiffany a new pack of cards, then he moved away. Tiffany shuffled the new cards quickly, then cut them, divided them into two parts, and put them flat on the table. But Bond saw that the two halves were not quite the same. When she shuffled them again, she was going to put the cards back into the same place. She put them in front of Bond to cut. He watched her shuffle them again, cleverly moving the cards just where she needed them. And so the new pack of cards was fixed. She dealt him two cards, then gave two to herself. Bond looked at his two cards, a jack and a ten. He looked up at the girl and shook his head. He didn't want another card. She turned her cards over. They added up to sixteen. She took another card, a king. Now the three cards added up to more than twenty-one. She had busted. She had silver dollars and counters for twenty dollars next to her. But the pit boss moved quickly to her side with a thin thousand-dollar plaque. She pushed it across to Bond. Bond bet again. She dealt him two more cards. Seventeen. Again he shook his head. She had twelve and took two more cards, a three and a nine. Busted again and the pit boss was there with another thousand-dollar plaque. With his next bet, Bond got cards that added up to nineteen. She turned over a ten and a seven and had to stand. Another thousand-dollar plaque came to Bond. More people were coming into the gambling room now. Soon they were going to be round the tables. This was his last bet. After this, he was supposed to get up from the table and leave her. She dealt him two cards, and he picked them up. Twenty. And she picked up two tens. Bond smiled. Both took another card and busted. She quickly dealt him two more cards, just as three more players came to the table. He had nineteen, and she had sixteen. And that was the end. Bond took his last thousand-dollar plaque. He got up from the table and looked across at the girl. Thank you, he said. You deal beautifully. Tiffany Case looked hard at Bond. You're welcome, she said. Bond turned and walked away to the bar. So now he had his five thousand dollars. He remembered what Shady Tree had told him. Don't bet any more. Bond smiled then finished his drink and walked across the room to the nearest roulette table. Five thousand dollars on red, he told the croupier. The croupier looked closely at him, then put the five thousand dollar plaques onto the red. Bond saw him push a button under the table with his knee. A moment later, the pit boss walked across to the table. At the same time, the croupier turned the wheel. Bond lit a cigarette. He had a wonderful feeling of freedom. Nobody was going to tell him what to do any more, and he knew that he was going to win. The wheel turned more slowly, and the little ball fell into its red place. Thirty-six, red, said the croupier. He pulled in some losing counters and pushed some money across to the winning players. 
Then he took a large, thin, $5,000 plaque and put it next to Bond. Put it on black, said Bond. Now several more people came to watch. Bond felt their eyes on him, but he looked across the table to the pit boss. The man looked a little nervous. Bond smiled at him as the wheel turned. Seventeen, black, said the croupier. There were noises of excitement from the watching crowd. They watched the croupier push the big plaque in front of Bond. Now there was another man standing next to the pit boss. He was a big, square-shaped man, and he was looking at Bond with hard, bright eyes. It was Serafimo Spang. He looked a little like his brother in London. Now for the last throw, thought Bond, and then I'm leaving here with $20,000 of Spang money. He looked across at his employer. Spang's eyes were still watching him. Red, said Bond. He gave the $5,000 plaque to the croupier. The wheel turned. The little ball fell into its place. Five, red, said the croupier, and there were more noises of excitement from the people around the table. I'll take my money, said Bond. Thanks. Bond put the four plaques in his pocket and moved through the crowd. He walked across to the cashier's desk. Three notes of five thousand and five of ones, he said to the man. The cashier took Bond's four plaques and gave him the money. Bond went to the hotel desk and asked for an airmail envelope. Then he moved to a writing desk next to the wall. He put the three large notes in the envelope and wrote on the front, The Managing Director, Universal Export, Regent's Park, London NW1, England. Then he bought stamps at the desk and put the envelope into the U.S. mailbox. He hoped it would be safe. He looked at his watch. Five minutes to midnight. He looked round the room for the last time. There was a new dealer at Tiffany Case's table, and Mr. Spang was not there anymore. Bond walked back to his room and locked the door. It had been an interesting evening. Chapter 14 Gunfights For most of the next day, Bond waited at the hotel for something to happen. When he got tired of waiting, he phoned Ernie Cureo. Let's meet for a talk, he said. Cureo came to get him that evening, and they drove away from the strip. What happened last night? asked Ernie Cureo. Did you win anything? I won some money at roulette, said Bond. It won't worry Spang. He's rich. How does he spend his money? He's crazy about the Old West, said Cureo. He bought himself a ghost town out on Highway 95. It's called Specterville. It has a western saloon bar, a hotel, and even an old railway station. And Spang bought one of the old trains. He keeps it in the station at Specterville. At weekends, he takes his friends for a ride to Rhyolite. It's another ghost town, about 50 miles away. It gets lots of visitors. That's why I haven't heard from Spang or his friends all day, thought Bond. It's Friday, so they'll be out playing trains. After some minutes, Cureo said, We're being followed front and back. Do you see that black Chevrolet in front with the two men? They've got two driving mirrors and they're watching us. Behind us is a little red Jaguar. Two more men with golf clubs on the back seat. They belong to the Detroit Purple Gang and they don't play golf. I'll try and lose them. Bond took a thousand dollar note from his pocket and pushed it into Cureo's shirt pocket. That's for any damage to your car. Okay, Ernie. Let's see what you can do. He took his Beretta out of its holster and held it in his hand. This is what I've been waiting for, he thought. 
It was a straight road with not much traffic. Ahead, the tops of the mountains were yellow in the evening sun. They were riding easily along with the Jaguar behind them and the black Chevrolet in front. Without warning, Cureo pushed his foot down hard and stopped the car suddenly. The Jaguar hit them from behind and there was a crash of metal and glass. Cureo then drove away fast down the road. Bond looked out of the back window. They're out of the car, he said. The windscreen is broken. There's glass everywhere. They're trying to pull the front part of the car off the wheels. Good work, Ernie. It stopped them for a little while. Get down, said Cureo. The Chevrolet has stopped at the side of the road. They may try some shooting. Bond felt the car move forward fast. Cureo was half lying on the front seat, driving with one hand. There were two loud cracks as they went past the Chevrolet. Glass fell around Bond. The car almost went off the road before Cureo got it straight again. Bond pushed out the broken glass in the back window. The Chevrolet was coming after them. I'm going to turn suddenly and stop in the next side road, said Cureo. It'll give you a clear shot when they come round the corner after us. Now! The car went round the corner on two wheels, and Bond held onto his seat. The car stopped suddenly. Bond jumped out, his gun in his hand. The Chevrolet came round the corner fast. Bond fired his gun. Crack! 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 All four bullets hit the car. The Chevrolet went across the road, hit a tree, turned completely round and went slowly over onto its side. And stopped. Bond watched fire come from the front of it. Someone was trying to get out of a window. Soon the flames were going to find petrol on the ground and the whole car was going to explode. It was going to be too late for the man inside. Bond heard a sound behind him. He turned to see Ernie Cureo fall from the driver's seat of the taxi and across the passenger seat. Bond forgot the burning Chevrolet and pulled open the car door. There was blood all over Cureo's arm. Bond pulled him carefully onto the passenger seat and his eyes opened. Get me out of here, he said, and drive fast. That Jaguar will soon be coming to find us. Then get me to a doctor. Okay, Ernie, said Bond. He got into the driving seat and started the car. He moved fast down the road, away from the burning Chevrolet. Can you see anything in the mirror? asked Cureo. There's a car coming fast after us, said Bond. It's the Jaguar. We have to find somewhere to hide, said Cureo. There is a drive-in cinema near here. There, turn right. See those lights? Get in there quick. That's right, between those cars. Turn off your lights. Stop. The taxi stopped in the back line of six rows of cars. They looked towards a large cinema screen. A man was saying something to a woman on the screen. Two more cars drove in and stopped. Neither of them was the Jaguar. A girl came up to the taxi. That's a dollar, please, she said. She connected a loudspeaker to a metal post next to the car. Then she hung the speaker inside the window next to Bond. The voices of the man and woman on the screen filled the car. The girl moved away to the next car. Turn the sound off, said Cureo. He spoke with difficulty. Watch the entrance. We'll wait a little while, then you can get me to a doctor. Bond found a switch and the voices stopped. He looked out into the darkness towards the entrance, but could see nothing. Suddenly, a dark shape came up from the ground and a gun was pointing at Bond's face. Then a voice from outside Ernie Cureo's side of the car whispered, OK, boys, don't do anything stupid. Bond looked at the face next to him. Get out or we'll shoot your friend the man told him. You and the two of us are going for a drive.
Bond turned and saw the gun pushed into Cureo's neck. I'll go with them, Ernie, he said. I'll soon be back to get you to a doctor. Sorry, friend, said Cureo in a tired voice. I think... There was a soft noise as the gun hit him behind the ear. He fell forward and was silent. Bond stepped slowly out of the car, and the three men walked towards the entrance. Chapter 15 Specterville The Red Jaguar was outside the entrance, its windscreen broken. They took Bond's gun before he climbed in next to the driver. Where are we going? he asked. You'll see, said the driver. He was a thin man with an unkind face. They were soon driving along a moonlit road towards the mountains. There was a big sign which said 95. Bond remembered that Specterville was on Highway 95. So these men were taking him to Mr. Spang. Bond suddenly felt that he did not know enough of the answers. Did they know who he really was? He could say that he had not understood his orders about the gambling, but how to explain all the shooting? He could say that he thought the four men were from another gang. Well, now I'm about to get to the end of the pipeline, he thought. After two hours of driving, they stopped outside some high gates. There was a sign outside. It said, Specterville, do not enter. Dangerous dogs. On the gate was a button and a speaking box. A small sign next to it said, Ring and say who you are. The driver pushed the button and a voice said, Yes, from inside the box. Fresso and McGonagall, said the driver loudly. OK, McGonagall, said the voice. There was a click and the gate slowly opened. They drove through them and down a narrow road. The gates closed behind them. The road went on for about a mile. Then there were lights in front of them. They went down a hill and suddenly there were brightly lit buildings. Past them, the moon shone down on a single, straight railway line. It went on as far as Bond could see. The car stopped in front of grey houses and shops. One bigger building had a sign outside. It said, Pink Gutter Saloon Bar. From behind the western swing half-doors, yellow light came out onto the street. The sound of a piano playing came from inside. It was all like something out of a western film. Get out, McGonagall told Bond. The three men climbed out of the car and onto the wooden pavement. Bond stopped. Come on, said McGonagall. Bond slowly followed him to the door of the saloon. He stopped for a moment as the swing half-doors came back towards his face. He felt Frasso's gun pushing into his back. Now, thought Bond. He jumped through the doors and threw McGonagall round and into Frasso. The two men crashed back onto the pavement. McGonagall was up on his feet first with a gun in his hand. Bond's hand came down on the gun and knocked it to the ground. Frasso fired two shots at Bond, but the secret agent dropped to the ground and picked up the gun at McGonagall's feet. He fired two quick shots at Frasso from the ground. Then McGonagall stepped on his hand and fell on top of him. Bond went down, but he saw and heard Frasso crash down onto the pavement outside. Then McGonagall's hands were on him. For several seconds, the two men fought silently, like animals. Bond got up on one knee and pushed the other man off him. As he did this, McGonagall's knee came up and hit Bond's face. Bond fell back, but then stood up. McGonagall came towards him with his head down. Bond turned away quickly, but the gangster's head hit him in the chest and two fists crashed into his body. The gangster's head came up and Bond hit him hard in the face. McGonagall fell back, but Bond went after him. He reached for the gangster's foot, 
and pulled it away from the floor. Then he turned and threw the man into the room. McGonagall's flying body crashed down on top of the piano. The piano fell to the floor with McGonagall flat on the top of it. Stop! A girl's voice came across the room from the bar. Slowly, Bond turned round. There were four people standing with their backs to the bar. Mr. Spang stood in front of the other three. He was dressed like a cowboy, with shiny black boots and two guns in holsters at his sides. Tiffany Case stood next to him. She wore a western dress of white and gold. She stood and watched Bond. Her eyes were shining and she looked nervous. Then there were the two men in black hoods, the two from the Acme Baths at Saratoga. Each of them pointed a gun at Bond. Bring him this way, said Mr. Spang. He left the room. Tiffany Case gave Bond a warning look as she followed him. The two men came close to Bond. The big one said, Move! Bond walked slowly after the girl and the two hooded men walked behind him. Bond pushed through a door behind the bar. He looked around and saw that he was now in a railway station waiting room. Turn right, said one of them. Bond turned and went through a door. In front of him was probably the most beautiful steam train in the world. There were three metal shining lights on the front of the big old engine. The name The Cannonball was painted along the side in black and gold. Behind the engine was a dark blue carriage. Bond looked at the train, but then he felt a gun in his back. Bond climbed up into the carriage. First there was a small but beautiful dining room, then a narrow room with three doors at the sides. With the two men still behind him, Bond walked to the end and pushed open the door into a big room. It was a sitting room with bookshelves on each side and expensive curtains. A thick red carpet covered the floor. Mr. Spang stood at the far end of the room. In the middle sat Tiffany Case. She was nervously smoking a cigarette. Bond walked to a comfortable chair. He turned it towards Spang and Tiffany and sat down. He crossed one knee slowly over the other, then lit a cigarette. Stay here, Wint, said Mr. Spang. Kid, go and phone Detroit. Tell them to send more men. He turned towards Bond and his eyes shone angrily. Now, who are you and what's happening? Bond did not like Spang's question. I'll need a drink if we're going to talk, said Bond. Bourbon. Get it, Wint, Mr. Spang said coldly. The big man walked out of the room. Minutes later, he came back and pushed a glass into Bond's hand. Thanks, Wint, said Bond. He drank some of the bourbon, then put the glass down on the floor next to him. He looked up at Mr. Spang. I did my job and got paid, said Bond. It was my money, and I decided to gamble with it. Then a lot of your men came after me. If you wanted to talk to me, why didn't you just telephone me? When they started shooting, it was time for me to shoot back. So I did. Without taking his eyes off Bond, Mr. Spang slowly pulled a piece of paper from his shirt pocket. Bond knew that the piece of paper was bad news for him. Really bad news. This is a message from a good friend in London. It says, Peter Franks is held by the police. Find out if the job is in any danger, then kill the new carrier and send a report. There was silence in the room. Mr. Spang looked hard at Bond. Well, Mr. Whoever You Are, he said at last, this looks like a good year for something horrible to happen to you. Bond tried to stay calm. He knew that they were going to hurt him, badly. But how? He reached down for his drink. 
Now he knew that the two spangs were the beginning and the end of the diamond pipeline. He had completed his job. He knew the answers. Now, in some way, he must get the answers back to M. I took the job from Peter Franks, he said. He decided that he didn't like it, and I needed money. You're lying, said Mr. Spang. You're with the police, or you're some kind of private detective. I'm going to find out who you are, who you work for, and what you know. He turned angrily to Tiffany Case. How did he trick you? Are you stupid? No, said Tiffany. ABC sent this man to me, and he seemed okay. Was I supposed to tell ABC to try again? And maybe this man is telling the truth. Her angry eyes turned towards Bond, and he saw fear in them, fear for him. Well, we're going to find out, said Mr. Spang. Went. Get kid and the boots. The boots? Bond sat silently. He had to be strong now. He must tell them nothing. He had to think of Ernie Cureo and Felix Leiter, and maybe Tiffany Case. He heard the two men come up behind him. Take him out onto the station, said Mr. Spang. OK, boss, said Wint. The two hooded men sat down. They put football boots down on the thick carpet next to them. Then they started to take off their shoes. Chapter 16 The Cannonball James, said Tiffany Case, wake up! After some moments, Bond's blackened eyes opened with difficulty. He looked up at her from the wooden floor. She shook his blood-covered arm, afraid that he might fall asleep again. He seemed to understand, and slowly pulled himself up onto his hands and knees. Can you walk? she asked. Wait, he said. He could feel his feet and hands. He could move his head from side to side. He could see the moonlight. He could hear her. It should be all right, he thought, but he just wanted to sleep. Or to die. Anything to stop the pain that was in him and all over him. Anything to kill the memory of those four boots kicking him. We're in the waiting room, she whispered. We must get to the end of the station. She opened the door and Bond got up on his feet. With Tiffany's arm round him, he walked slowly out into the end of the station. And there was a railroad handcar. Bond looked at it. Petrol? he whispered. Tiffany pointed to some petrol cans by the station wall. I've just filled it, she whispered back. They use it to check the railway line. Get on it, she smiled. Next stop, Rhyolite. You're a great girl, whispered Bond. But there'll be a lot of noise when we start that thing. He turned and looked at the buildings behind him. I've got an idea. Have you got some matches or a cigarette lighter? She took a lighter out of her pocket and gave it to him. What's the idea? she said. We need to get moving. Bond went across to the cans of petrol and started opening them. He threw petrol over the wooden walls. When several cans were empty, he went back to her. Start the handcar, he whispered. He picked up an old newspaper from next to the railway track. Tiffany started the handcar engine. Bond lit the newspaper with the lighter, then threw it towards the petrol cans. Boom! Flames shot into the sky. James! cried Tiffany. Bond got onto the handcar as it started to move away. Soon they were speeding along the track, and Bond felt the cool night air. Are you okay? asked Tiffany. You look terrible. 
Nothing's broken, said Bond. I had to sit and listen to them kicking you, she said. Spang stayed and listened and watched me. After they put ropes round you and threw you into the waiting room, everyone went to bed. I waited an hour before I came down to you. You're going to be in trouble if they catch us, said Bond. Don't worry about me, she said. First, we have to get this thing to Rhyolite. Then, we'll have to find a car and get to California. I've got money. We need to get you to a doctor and buy you a new shirt. I've got your gun. I got it after Spang went to bed. She opened her shirt and took it from her belt. Bond took it from her and pushed it into the top of his trousers. His shirt was covered in blood. The miles went by. Every few minutes, Bond turned and looked behind them. They had been traveling nearly an hour when they heard a new sound. It's the cannonball, said Tiffany. They looked back along the railway line. Was that a small light far away? How far is it to Rhyolite? asked Bond. About thirty miles. How fast can this thing go? About thirty miles an hour. After fifteen minutes, Bond could see the lights on the front of the big engine. Are we okay for petrol? he asked. Yes, she said. I put in a whole can. Almost before she finished speaking, the little engine went putt, putt, putt. Oh, no, said Tiffany. And again, putt, putt, putt. Then, putt, putt, pss. And suddenly they were moving down the track in silence, the engine dead. Minutes later, the handcar stopped. No more petrol, said Bond. He looked round. There was flat, open land for two miles on the left, and mountains half a mile away on the right. Come on, Tiffany, he said. We've got to go. He looked round and saw her running down the track in front of the handcar. After a moment, she turned and ran back. There is a sideline in front, she said. If you can move the points on the track, we can push this thing down the sideline. Then the train will miss us. Bond smiled. I've got a better idea. Come on, start pushing. Once it started moving, the handcar moved down the track easily. They came to the points by the sideline, and Bond went on pushing until they were past them. What are you doing? asked Tiffany. Bond ran back to the points. We're going to send the cannonball down the sideline. Help me move the point switch. They both pulled hard on the switch. The pain in Bond's arms was terrible. But slowly the old metal moved for the first time in 50 years. Then it was done, and Tiffany helped Bond back to the handcar. Suddenly the night air was full of the noise of the great metal train as it rushed towards them. Get down and don't move, shouted Bond. He pushed Tiffany down behind the handcar. Then he went across to the side of the railway line and took out his gun. A bullet hit the ground next to him. Crack, crack, crack. Now he could hear the gun above the sound of the engine. And then the big engine flew into the sideline with a scream of metal. Bond saw Spang in the cab of the engine. He was almost falling out, holding the side of the cab with one hand and driving the engine with the other. Bond lifted his gun and fired four shots. He saw Spang's white face suddenly turn up to the sky. Then the great black and gold engine was past him and rushing towards the Spectre Mountains. Its lights cut through the darkness and a warning bell began to ring, but nothing could stop it now. Bond put the gun into his trousers as Tiffany Case ran across to him. They watched the engine go behind a large rock, and suddenly there was a terrible crash and a great burst of fire. And then, silence. And that's the end of one of the Spangs, thought Bond. Let's get away from here, said Tiffany. It took them an hour and a half to walk the two miles to the main road. Tiffany half-carried Bond. 
When they reached the road, he fell down, full of pain. The girl sat and held him against her. She cleaned his face with a corner of her shirt. An hour later, a low black car stopped next to them. A head came out of the driver's window. A friendly Texan voice said, Felix Leiter, miss. What can I do for you on this beautiful morning? And when I got into town, I called my friend Ernie Cureo, said Leiter. His wife told me that he was in hospital. So I went and saw Ernie, and he told me the whole story. So I drove through the night to Spectreville and saw that the place was on fire. The gates were open, so I went inside. The only person there was a man on his hands and knees trying to get away. He had a broken leg, and his name was Frasso. I made Frasso tell me everything. Then I left him for the fire department to find when they arrived. Next, I drove towards Rhyolite. I found a pretty girl in the middle of the road, and here we are. Now tell me your story. So I'm not dreaming, thought Bond. I am in the back of the Studebaker, and this is Tiffany's arm under my head. And that is Felix, and we are going down the road to a doctor. Some food, a bath, a drink, and sleep. He lay still and listened to their voices. At the end of Tiffany's story, Leiter said, We'll be in Los Angeles by lunchtime. Before that, we could stop at Olancha and get James to a doctor, but we must get you and James out of the country as soon as possible. Once the rest of the spangled mob finds you, they'll kill you. We need to get you on a plane to New York tonight and on your way to England tomorrow. But who is this man Bond? said Tiffany. Is he a private detective? Ask him yourself, Bond heard Leiter say carefully. Don't worry, he'll look after you. After that, Bond fell asleep. He woke up outside the house of Dr. Otis Fairplay in Olancha. The doctor cleaned Bond's cuts. Then he, Leiter and Tiffany got some breakfast before they drove away again. Chapter 17 On the Queen Elizabeth The bar of the Beverly Hills Hotel in Los Angeles was dark and cool. There were new suitcases next to Bond and Tiffany. Bond wore his nice new Hollywood clothes and sat drinking his martini. There was a telephone on the table next to the drinks. Felix Leiter finished talking to New York for the fourth time that evening. He put down the phone. My friends at the office have got you tickets for the Queen Elizabeth and a passport for you, Tiffany. The ship leaves from New York for England tomorrow night at 8 o'clock. They'll meet you at LaGuardia Airport in the morning. They went to get the rest of your things from the Astor, James. Thanks, Felix, said Bond. There is a report in the newspaper about the Spectreville fire, Leiter went on. Nothing about Spang. My friends tell me that the police aren't looking for you, but the gangsters are. They'll pay $10,000 to the person who kills you. Get on the ship and stay in your cabins for two or three days. Now, I've got to get back to Las Vegas tonight. Leiter drove them to the airport. You've got a good friend there, Tiffany told Bond when they were watching him drive away. On the plane, Bond sat in his seat and thought about the beautiful Tiffany sitting next to him. He knew that he was very near to being in love with her. But what about her? Would she ever be able to trust and perhaps love a man again? He thought too about the diamond smuggling pipeline. One part of it was finished, but Serafimo was only the end of the pipeline. Jack Spang and the mystery man ABC were the real bosses. Did Jack Spang and ABC know about his and Tiffany's escape? So now they had to find Jack Spang, and then ABC. The Secret Service could only find the man at the beginning of the pipeline in Africa through ABC. 
he planned to send a report to M when they were on the Queen Elizabeth. Valance's men could then do the rest. There would not be much for Bond to do in London, only write reports. At about four o'clock on Sunday afternoon, Bond and Tiffany went to their cabins on the Queen Elizabeth. A man watched them go on to the ship. He then walked quickly to a telephone. Three hours later, two American businessmen got out of a black car and walked onto the ship. One was a young man with white hair. The name on his small case was B. Kitteridge. The other man was big and fat. He looked sick. The name on his suitcase was W. Winter. Below the name were the words, My blood group is F. Three days later, Bond met Tiffany in the ship's veranda grill for dinner. The weather was fine and the sea was calm. Now tell me, James, said Tiffany, what do you do and who do you work for? I work for the government, said Bond. They want to stop the diamond smuggling. You're a sort of secret agent. Just a government worker, said Bond. OK, said Tiffany. They were silent for some minutes. Then she suddenly put a hand on his hand. Listen, you Bond person, I love being here with you. And I love being with you, Tiffany, said Bond. He paused, then went on. Felix told me a little about you, about the attack. Oh, she said. Did he? She began to shake a little. Don't think about it, said Bond. This is today, here and now, not yesterday or a long time ago. Tell me about your work as a dealer at the casino. She became calmer, and they talked about blackjack. Now tell me about you, she said. What sort of a woman do you like? Somebody who can make good sauce bernays, said Bond, smiling. He looked closely at her, and she's got to have gold hair and blue eyes, and she must know how to play cards, the usual things. She laughed. And would you marry this person? I'm almost married already, to a man. His name's M. Later, Bond took her back to her cabin, then went to his cabin and had a shower. Soon after, there was a knock on the door. A waiter came in carrying a small tray. What's that? asked Bond. It has just come up from the kitchen, said the man. He went out and closed the door. Bond looked at the tray. On it was a bottle of champagne, a plate with four small pieces of steak, and a small bowl of sauce. Next to this was a note. It said, Miss T. Case made this sauce bernaise without my help. The chef. Bond smiled and filled a glass with champagne. He put a lot of the sauce on a piece of steak. He ate it, then he went to the telephone. Tiffany? He heard a little laugh at the other end. Then he said, Well, you can certainly make wonderful sauce bernaise. He put the phone down carefully. Chapter 18 Dead Men Can't Speak It was eleven o'clock the next evening. There were only a few people left in the veranda grill. It was quiet, with only the soft sound of the sea outside. Bond and Tiffany had finished their dinner. They were holding hands and looking silently into each other's eyes. After a time, they got up and walked to the smoking room. They found a small table in a corner and ordered coffee. Bond suddenly saw that two men were looking at him. They were sitting at a table across the room and they looked away quickly. One man had white hair and the other was big and fat. Bond looked carefully at the fat man. Had he seen this man before? He turned back to Tiffany. Those two men across the room seem interested in us, he said. She looked past his shoulder. They're not looking at us now. The fat man's sucking his thumb. 
the white-haired man just looks stupid. Sucking his thumb, said Bond. He was trying to remember something. Forget it, James, said Tiffany. Let's go. They finished their coffee and went down the stairs to the deck below. Bond put his arm round her, and Tiffany put her head on his shoulder. They walked in silence until they were inside Bond's cabin. Then Bond put his arms around her and said softly, My darling. Bond woke up to the sound of the telephone. The last thing he remembered was the door closing after Tiffany had left sometime during the night. The telephone bell rang again. Bond picked the telephone up. A voice said, There is a message for you, sir. Shall I send it down to you? Yes, thanks, said Bond. He looked at his watch. Three o'clock in the morning. He climbed out of bed and went into the shower. Afterwards he pulled on a shirt and trousers. There was a knock on the door. Bond opened it and took the message from the man outside. It was from the chief of staff in London. It said, Secret check of Say's office found message to ABC from QE, signed by Winter. Winter knows that you are on Queen Elizabeth. Reply addressed to Winter orders him to kill Tiffany Case. We believe Say is ABC. Say flew to Paris yesterday and is now reported to be in Dakar. We think that man at Sierra Leone is beginning of pipeline. He is being watched. You will fly to Sierra Leone tomorrow night. Bond sat quite still in his chair. So somebody from the Spangled Gang was on the ship. Who? Where? He quickly picked up the telephone and phoned Tiffany. He heard it ring once, twice, three times. Bond dropped the phone and ran to her cabin. It was empty. Bond tried to think. Would the man question her before he killed her? Would he try to find out what she knew about Bond? Would he take her to his cabin? But which cabin? Bond ran to his cabin and found the passenger list. Winter! Cabin A-49. Suddenly he remembered everything. Winter! Wint and Kid, the two men in hoods, the two men on the plane from London. Bond got his gun and pushed it into the top of his trousers. A-49 was below his cabin. That helps, he thought. He opened one of the two round windows in his cabin and looked down. How far down was A-49? More than two metres. The sea was calm and there was no wind. It's a hot night, Bond thought. Will one of their windows be open? He took the sheets from his bed and began to tie them together. He tied one end of the rope round part of the window. Then he threw the tied sheets down the side of the ship. Don't look up and don't look down, he told himself. Don't even think about it. His mouth was dry and he could feel his heart beating fast. Some minutes later, he felt the metal window of A-49 beneath his feet. It was open. His foot told him that the curtains inside the window were closed. He climbed on down. There were voices inside the room. Suddenly, a girl's voice cried, No! There was a moment's silence, then the sound of a slap. It was as loud as a gun firing a shot. Bond pushed himself through the curtains and into the cabin. He crashed to the floor, rolled over, and came up with his gun in his hand. It pointed at a place between two men. "'Who sent for you?' said the fat man calmly. He was sitting in a chair opposite Tiffany. She was sitting on another chair. She was naked except for a pair of pants. She looked at Bond, and her eyes were wild and frightened. The white-haired man was sitting on the bed. He smiled at Bond. "'Tiffany,' said Bond, "'go into the bathroom and close the door, "'then get into the bath and lie down.' She moved quickly to the bathroom and shut the door behind her. "'Now she's safe from bullets,' Bond thought, "'and she won't see what I have to do.' 48, 65, 
86, the fat man said the words fast. Were the words an American football signal? The fat man suddenly threw himself onto the floor. The white-haired man started to roll off the bed and away from Bond. Bond fired his gun. A hole opened up just below the man's white hair. His body fell. The fat man on the floor had his gun half out of his trousers. Drop it and get up, ordered Bond. The fat man dropped the gun and stood up. He looked into Bond's eyes. He was afraid. Sit down, said Bond. The fat man turned and walked back towards his chair. He sat down. Suddenly, his right hand reached down the side of his leg and came up with a throwing knife. Crack! The bullet from Bond's gun and the knife went past each other in the air. The eyes of the two men showed sudden pain, but the fat man's eyes closed a moment later. He fell backwards with his hand on the hole in his chest. Bond's eyes looked down at the blood on the front of his shirt. The handle of the knife was hanging down from his shirt. He turned and looked out of the open window. Very slowly, his body started to relax. After a moment or two, he pulled the knife from his shirt and threw it out of the window into the darkness. He walked across to the bathroom. Tiffany, it's me, he said, and opened the door. She was lying face down in the bath with her hands over her ears. He helped her out of the bath and stood with his arms round her. You're hurt, she said. She took off his shirt and washed the cut on his chest with soap and water. Bond collected her clothes from the cabin and brought them back to the bathroom. Get dressed, he said. Then clean everything that you've touched. We don't want to leave any fingerprints. He went back into the cabin. For the next half hour he did everything very carefully. He held the gun over the hole in the fat man's shirt and fired a second bullet through the hole. Now there were smoke marks around the hole. Next he put the gun in the fat man's right hand. You shot yourself, he told the dead man. He went across to the white-haired man, man and picked him up. He carried him to the window and pushed him through it. He looked back at the fat man. You and your friend had a fight, he said. You shot yourself after you threw your friend out of the window. That's the story. I hope the police like it when we get to Southampton. He cleaned his fingerprints off everything that he had touched, pulled the sheets off one of the beds, then went to get Tiffany. He had to get her back to his cabin without anyone seeing them, and then sleep with her body close to his and his arms round her forever. Forever? He looked at the dead eyes of the body on the floor. They seemed to speak to him, saying, Nothing is forever. Only death is forever. Chapter 19 The End of the Pipeline It was hot under the large bush at the meeting place of three African countries. The smuggler listened. The helicopter was coming. The smuggler walked out into the moonlight to get the packet of diamonds from his motorcycle. A mile away, an army truck was behind a low bush. Three men stood next to it, two soldiers and Bond. Near them was a large gun pointing at the sky. They could hear the noise of the helicopter. Get ready, said Bond. Is the loudspeaker switched on? Yes, sir, said one of the soldiers. Bond looked up into the sky. He thought about Tiffany, safe at his home in London. He wanted this job to be finished so that he could go back and see her again. The smuggler from the mines was also looking up. The helicopter came down and flew above his head. An arm came out and a torch flashed the code for A. The man on the ground flashed back B and C. Then the helicopter landed. The pilot started to climb out. He was wearing a flying helmet. That's unusual, thought the smuggler, and he looks taller than the usual pilot. Have you got the stuff? asked the pilot. It was an American voice. Yes, said the man from the mines. 
Where's the usual pilot? He won't be coming again. I am ABC. I am closing the pipeline. Oh, said the smuggler nervously. He gave the pilot the packet. Suddenly, the pilot took a gun from his coat and shot the smuggler three times. The smuggler's eyes opened wide with shock. Then he fell to the ground and lay still. Don't move or we shoot! The voice from the loudspeaker came across the open ground. The pilot ran towards the helicopter and climbed in. The door crashed shut behind him. Moments later, the helicopter began to move up into the sky. Bond shouted, Now! He was sitting on the seat behind the gun. The two soldiers turned the gun towards the sky and Bond shot at the helicopter. Red fire filled the sky and then there was a much louder BANG! The helicopter began to come down crazily to the ground. Inside it, Jack Spang, who was also Rufus B. Say of the House of Diamonds, and also the big boss, ABC, came down with it. Before the sound of the crash died, flames shot up into the sky. Bond lit a cigarette and sat watching the orange flames from the helicopter. That's the end of the diamond pipeline, he said softly. The end of the spangled mob. But not the end of the diamonds that are in the center of the fire. Diamonds don't die. Diamonds are forever. And Bond suddenly remembered the eyes of the dead Wint. They had been wrong. Death is forever. But so were diamonds. He jumped down from the truck and started to walk towards the fire. All these thoughts about death and diamonds were too serious. For Bond, it was just the end of another adventure. He thought about the beautiful woman waiting for him in London.